Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1994 film Immortal Beloved. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this film, I would like to give a special shout out to Dark Metal Spider for requesting this review. And if there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to either my PayPal or to my Patreon. The link to both is in the video description down below, and I will try to get to your request as soon as I possibly can. Now, Immortal Beloved is one of those movies that's been hanging around on a watch list of mine for many, many years, because I am honestly a fan of these movies that focus on these musical maestros of the past, and it's something that definitely does fascinate me. Uh, it stems from seeing Amadeus at a very young age on DVD. So these kind of films are definitely right up my alley, but I have to be in the right mood for them. And, and I guess I just never really felt like I was in the right mood until fairly recently. And I'm really glad that I saw this. I wouldn't say that it's a masterpiece to me, but it's still a, a solid film. I still think it's a really good movie. I think it could have been truly phenomenal if there were a few things that were kind of tweaked a little bit, but the film that we, we have here, the film that exists is still quite exquisite. It's directed by uh, Bernard Rose and Bernard Rose is just a terrific and tremendous talent when it comes to a director. I mean, to me, his finest hour, his finest work is still Candyman, but this is also up there, especially the Ode to Joy sequence, which was just a visual spectacle of epic proportions. Like, it really was. And this was a passion project of Bernard's because he is a huge fan of Beethoven, loves Beethoven's music. And he's really fascinated and intrigued by the Immortal Beloved, which is a mystery uh, involving this woman, this mystery woman, who Beethoven was genuinely in love with. And he wrote a letter before he died, bequeathing his fortune and and everything to this mystery woman. And Rose really liked that. He also, of course, is a huge fan of Beethoven. So it was just a project that really spoke to him. And this was a labor of love from Bernard Rose. The reason why this got made is because of Bernard Rose. Like, he's the one that wrote the script. He's also the one that was attached as director before anyone was even cast and it really does show the passion that he has for this topic and for this material is is immense and almost immeasurable because you can really sense that bernard is just a true lover of not only Beethoven's music, but classical music in general. And so what he does with this film is he treats the direction almost in a way like it's a music video because he is focusing on the music first and how Beethoven's music is going to be incorporated into a given scene. And then everything else second in terms of uh, the performances or other aspects of, of, of directing. And it leads to a very unique film that has some absolutely just lavish visuals in terms of the way that he shoots the the settings and the the art direction and the costuming 
but also some visuals that are in some ways in the realm of fantasy. The whole scene during the Oge Joy sequence that in many ways is in essence the the uh, climax of the film where young Beethoven is laying there in, in, in the lake at night and he's looking up at the stars and the stars are reflected in the water and Bernard Rose shoots the scene where it's a top-down uh, perspective looking down at Beethoven while he's floating in the water and then he slowly pans the camera uh, out and reveals that it's almost like Beethoven is laying in a field of stars. And that whole sequence, the way that is directed, I'm getting chills just thinking about that scene. Uh, and the way that he incorporates those elements along with the, the, the performance of Ode to Joy and the audience's reaction to it and, and older Beethoven and him being there but also being a, a, a genuine shell of himself it's just a really spectacular sequence uh from a directorial standpoint and i really appreciated that rose he was not afraid of being very romantic with the visuals because beethoven was very well known for his romanticism and also willing to be more mysterious, darker, uh, not necessarily quite horror, but if you uh, made a few uh, changes, it very well could be. It could be something you could see out of a period piece uh, thriller or something along the lines of From Hell or a Dr. And, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movie. Really makes me wish that Bernard Rose was... I don't know if he directed, I don't think he did direct Mary Riley, but Bernard Rose would have been a really great choice to direct a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movie. But yeah, I just really thought the film was something genuinely uh, special when it comes to uh, the direction by Rose and just the way that he just effortlessly combined Beethoven's music with the visuals. It was just something that really did speak to me, especially as somebody who is very musical. And what I mean by that is I have an ear for music. It's how I was able to do choir for so many years without really necessarily being able to read the the uh the music on the page uh, i learned how to s sing a lot of these different songs including ode to joy by ear and so this kind of movie really does tap into a a, a certain part of me that other films just aren't capable of doing because of the emotion that music can provide and especially the combination of visuals with the music. It creates something that is just genuinely spectacular when it's done the right way. And I really do feel that Immortal Beloved is definitely one of those. And the piano pieces and stuff that also speaks to me because I played piano uh, I, and piano is something that for me personally, even though I'm not like a maestro or anything, it it's still something that really means a lot to me because it was something that I accomplished in my life that people told me that I couldn't do. I had a music teacher in, in uh, elementary school who flat out told me to my face that I will never be able to play piano with both hands. And my parents, they didn't believe that. They uh, ma managed to find a piano teacher who was willing to teach me and be patient with me. And 
at the end of the day, I played piano with both hands. I even sang while I was playing piano. So it's something that that really is to me personally it, it is something that really does speak to my soul so when a film like this is able to really get to that part of me it, it really is able to accomplish something that other films just can't really come close to. And I, I just want to thank Bernard Rose so much for what he brought to this film. I don't think this film would, film would be anywhere near as good without his involvement, because you could just tell that he knew. He knew that the music needed to speak for the emotion and for a lot of the other aspects of the story. The music needed to be paramount. Beethoven's music needed to be the focus and everything else uh, needed to be secondary. And it's something that you normally don't see that often when it comes to these kind of films. And he also was willing to take chances and take risks visually that I think others might not necessarily do, like the whole Ode to Joy sequence. So, yeah, I can't sing enough praises for Rose's work in this. And his screenplay, I think the script, it's good, but I don't think it's great. And I think the reason for that is that Beethoven as a character, he's a very irascible personality. He's very intense. And there are some genuine attempts that ultimately succeed to make him more sympathetic. But that doesn't really happen until the last half of the film. So when you have the first half of the movie, like the first hour of a story, for instance, and you're really just focusing on the mystery and having these series of vignettes about these different women that might be the immortal beloved juxtaposed with different uh, sequences involving Beethoven showcasing his intensity. There are moments where his rawness becomes a little bit too abrasive. And so it feels alienating. And so you're not really as invested in the story or in what is happening on the screen because you don't necessarily care as much. And I'm not saying that you don't care at all. I think the script does a good job making you somewhat intrigued because you're trying to figure out the mystery of who the immortal beloved is, but it doesn't do as good of a job making you genuinely care about Beethoven, the character for the first half of the story. Once you see more sympathetic notes, once you see what happens when the immortal beloved is revealed, then there are some moments that genuinely tug at your heartstrings and you really do feel for him, especially in his dying moments. But prior to that, it, it's tough. And I, and I know that might be intentional because that's kind of who Beethoven is and that's what he's known to be. But I just feel that it, it it just lacked a certain extra note. Like, I needed a little bit more of some good side to Beethoven so I could see some good in him that would make everything that happens and his just gradual descent into just being this just bitter man so much more tragic. And I think there were attempts to do that, but I just don't really feel it's that effective. And that's something that really does honestly come down to the script. It comes down to the writing. There are also some other moments that the way that they're presented in the movie, they're trying to be shocking and they come across as a bit exploitative 
and I don't really think that's the right vibe. Like the stuff involving, uh, the I, I believe it's uh, yeah, the the backstory of uh, Julieta Gucciardi, or is it was it Julieta Gucciardi or was it? No, I no, it was Isabel. It was it was uh, Anna Marie. It was Erdo er, Erdoti. It was uh, it was um, the count the countess. The backstory involving her, I believe that's who it was, where her two of her children are killed during uh, Napoleon's attack on Vienna. Yeah, that's who it is. Yeah, the the countess. Just the way that that was shown in the story, it, it did come across as a bit too exploitative. And I think part of it might actually be to how due to how that scene was shot. A little too much slow-mo, a little too much uh, of an almost over-the-top nature to it. I think it's because he's trying to make it match with the music, but with that kind of event, with that kind of um, tragedy, it, it just makes it come across like you're forcing something. And it just... I don't think it was necessarily the right call. And there are just a decent amount of scenes that just don't necessarily carry the same weight as I think they, they should. Like the whole, the whole scene where Beethoven, he is first showing the signs of his deafness. Or like the scene earlier where he's playing uh, the, what would be considered to be like the first bit of romanticism and music. And he feels betrayed because someone was listening in on him. You, you don't really necessarily get why he thinks the way he does in some of these scenes. Or why he reacts the way that he does. It just comes across like... It's too mysterious. It's too vague. And so you don't always get a clear picture of Beethoven as a character or as a person. You just get these glimpses, these, these uh, uh, brief little interludes and moments, but not anything that's consistently concrete. And that's a big reason why Beethoven as a character in this is not quite as efficient or as, as intriguing as some of the other elements of, of the story, specifically these other women that were uh, a part of his life or his uh, uh, secretary um, Schindler and, and, and uh, his whole, uh, connection with uh with beethoven and the and the stuff involving beethoven and his uh adopted son in carl who he adopted and and raised as his own son because of what happened with his brother his brother passed away so he decided to adopt his nephew carl and raise him as his own and he, and that whole bit too was also a little clunky like you have these moments where the narration is trying to say that oh this meant meant a lot to beethoven and and it it, it it tapped into a side of beethoven that you rarely saw because he really genuinely wanted the best for Carl and loved him like he was a son and there wasn't a lot of emphasis on that part of that relationship between him and Carl like there was a couple scenes at most but none of them really felt like that connection with the two really clicked and maybe that's the point Maybe the point is to show that 
it really was more about him trying to manipulate Carl and trying to use him for his own gain and make him a prodigy and make him his successor and so on and so forth. But if that is the case, that didn't really come across as clear as, as it could have either. And so when you have all this stuff that's kind of going against the, 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 the script, you just have a, a, a story that, is this kind of intermittently interesting? Like there's enough elements there that make it worth watching and continue and, and, wor and worth to continue following, but not really uh, enough to make it consistently um, engaging as a whole. And that's why I think you just could have had a little bit more of maybe Beethoven when he was younger or some of these other sort of things to just kind of flesh Beethoven out a little bit more as a character and as a, as a person. And I know there's a lot of an attempt to try to make him more human. And I think it really does work when it shows his flaws, when it shows him at his low point, when it shows him being picked on by kids while he's just sitting there in a stupor, but it also, it's a double-edged sword. Because of that approach to Beethoven, it just makes him into a character at times that is kind of insufferable. He's just, he's just so much of a intense personality that he just becomes somebody that you don't really become that passionate about. You're more passionate about the music than anything else. And I think that, that that's in a lot of uh, different ways why Bernard Rose decided to make this, in a lot of ways, more of a musical than really a typical biopic, because I think he even realized that that Beethoven as a character is just a very hard sell. And I think he did the best that he possibly could considering the circumstances. But even then, I think it could have like, I don't know. I wouldn't say dull his edges a little bit, but maybe have some more of the scenes where he's being more romantic and being the complete tonal opposite of what he would become later on and really have more of that stuff in the beginning and then have him gradually become more and more intense and more and more distant and more and more withdrawn emotionally as the film goes on instead of this very scattershot kind of, uh, of characterization of Beethoven. But I did like the way that the Bernard handled the various different women in his life and their involvement with Beethoven and their involvement with the overall story. Uh, Julieta and Anna Marie and um, Johanna. Now, another thing that I definitely want to give Rose credit for is just his level of research. Like, the man really did put a lot of effort into researching things and trying to solve the mystery of the immortal beloved in his own way. I know there's a lot of people who disagree with him, and there are people who have... Um, slam this film for its historical inaccuracies. But I appreciate that he did put in the research, but at the same time, he also didn't really decide that that was going to be a crux for this story. He wasn't going to focus on making it as realistic and as historically accurate as possible. Instead, he focused more on an emphasis of the music and the emotion behind it and how 
Beethoven is able to make you feel like you're in his shoes or inside his head when it comes to the emotion that he's wanting you to feel when it comes to his compositions. And I definitely think the whole overarching theme or the overarching plot involving the mystery of the Immortal Beloved was also very inspired and it really did help make the film still solid enough despite Beethoven as a character not being as strong as as he could have been because of just the way that he was written. But yeah, I mean, that's really just the main thing. My biggest problem with the script is just the way that Beethoven is portrayed. That's really about it. Other than that, I don't really have any major issues with the film. I mean, I would say the opening with the funeral, I don't really care for that kind of storytelling. I, I, I think you could have moved that scene to closer to the end. Um, but that's just me personally. I, I, I like storytelling that kind of isn't so jumbled and it can work sometimes. Like I do, I do agree that that can work and I see why it's doing that because it's having the whole thing with his assistant and he's trying to find out who the immortal beloved is. But I think you could have done that in a way where you don't show the funeral scene. You know that he's dead. They're working on his, his last will and testament. But then you can have like the funeral scene later on, uh, kind of as a as a more I wouldn't say satisfying denouement, but definitely a denouement for the story that I I think kind of clicks a little bit better. Or maybe not. Don't even have a funeral scene at all. Like I don't even really feel that scene really added that much to the movie. Like you get the gist that he's dead in the beginning because it's his last will and testament. So you don't even necessarily need that because it was, I was just kind of confused in terms of the emotion I was supposed to feel in that scene. Are they upset? Are they angry? Is it an angry mob who are going after Beethoven's uh, coffin or are they, uh, are they distraught? Are they, they sad? Are they, are they uh, just in tremendous pain because the world has lost such a, a talented uh, uh, composer? I don't know. I don't know. I the, the vibe just didn't really seem like it was that concise and clear. And so that's why that whole opening scene just kind of starts the film off kind of in an awkward spot. And that's why, you know, I'd be fine if you either move it somewhere else. So then you kind of get what the vibe is supposed to be more, or you just cut that scene out entirely. But that's just me. And when it comes to other elements of the film, I mean, the, the cast is is phenomenal. Like, it's a really good cast. Uh, for the most part, there's there's one actor in particular which I thought was pretty bad. Um, but Gary Oldman, I mean, this is one of his best acting roles. The way that he was able to play this difficult role in a way where he effectively played Beethoven and throughout different parts of his life at different ages and how he was able to really show what was going on inside of Beethoven's head, his emotions, his feelings, why he makes music, what he wants people to experience and feel when they hear his music, the dedication that he put into the role in terms of actually learning how to play piano and actually play these pieces, and just how open he was, how he was willing to just show Beethoven as this sad, pathetic figure near the end of his life, and he did it in a way that was just so realistic and just genuinely compelling. Uh, and there were even moments where he didn't even really say 
very much at all in terms of dialogue and still effectively conveyed these emotions. And yeah, it, it's it's a tremendous performance by Gary Oldman. Jaron Crabb, who was considered at one point to play Beethoven, as well as Stephen Ray. Uh, he's also really good, really solid here as Anton Schindler. Scenes between him and Oldman are, are really uh, fantastic. I think the two of them just have some really good chemistry, even when it comes to the scenes where it really does seem like their connection is fracturing at the seams. It's still something that leads to some really compelling cinema. Isabella Rossellini as Anna Marie, uh, Johanna Terstige as, as uh, Johanna, uh, and uh, Valeria uh, Golino as Julieta. Like the three women, uh, they're not only just beautiful women, but they are also really talented performers and actresses and really do a good job playing the, their roles. And I like that there is a variety with when it comes to their performances where you see them when they're young and they're beautiful, but then you see them later on when they're, they've got a few more wrinkles or in, in the countess's case, she's got a cane. Uh, and I, I like that those performances were also more than just eye candy for these actresses. There was a lot of moments for these actresses to really showcase their ability at, when it comes to their acting in, in very natural ways. Like nothing really felt forced when it comes to the three of them. It all felt very real and genuine. But there is an actor, I think it was the, the Marco Hofschneider is Carl von Bont Beethoven. And then there was another actor who played young Beethoven. I mean, not young Beethoven, uh, young Carl. The actor who played young Carl in particular was a, was a child actor. And I don't, I don't know. Yeah, Matthew North. Absolutely awful. Matthew North was so bad in his scenes that he honestly took me out of the movie. Ruined the illusion with his just flat line delivery really just a terrible performance always oh, a kid that doesn't that's no excuse there are plenty of child actors that actually can act this kid was not one of them and to be honest the guy who played the older carl wasn't much better and marco hofschneider but just still better than than the kid but other than that still thought it was a really uh really good cast overall Features some absolutely just luscious, lavish cinematography by Peter Shostinsky. The editing by Dan Ray was remarkable at times, especially when it comes to the scenes that really focus heavily on showcasing the music and the power and the weight of, of Beethoven's uh, music. And I like that there is no original score it's all beethoven's music like there's nothing there's nothing else because that's that's honestly what you need that's all you need when it comes to this movie you don't need any different interpretations of the music or some kind of original score i appreciate that no the score is beethoven and the movie is like 121 minutes and I gotta be honest, like during the first half, it kind of does drag a little bit. It's a slow burn, but once it gets going, it honestly becomes something that I, I genuinely do feel is worthwhile. I, I think it's worth a watch just to see how Beethoven's music is incorporated into the film visually or incorporated with the visuals in particular and for Gary Oldman's performance and Bernard Rose's direction and just the costume design and the art direction. It, it's, it's a film that I definitely do feel is without a doubt an acquired taste, but if it's something that does intrigue you and you or you're specifically a fan of classical music, or you're a fan of movies that are 
throwbacks, period pieces to this particular era, uh, I, I definitely would recommend uh, giving it a watch sometime. But anyway, that is my thoughts on Immortal Beloved, and thanks for watching my review, and I'll see you later. See ya.